So one of the dangers that you, we were talking about the danger of, of nuclear uh, using tactical nukes in uh, in Ukraine. So it's kind of this thing, right? It's like a, if Russia c- continues to, I don't want to say lose, but uh, they suffer losses, and as it gets worse and worse, um, obviously the tactic on their end, as you've described, was to wait out the Europeans, right? So there just seems to be this waiting out thing. Both sides are kind of like, how long can each side go? You know, how long can we, can we uh, extend this? You have certain figures that are saying, "Look, we need to we need to find a negotiation here. There ha- we have to end this war as soon as possible in the best possible way. The longer we go, the worse it's going to get, and the more cornered someone like Putin will be." The way you talk about Putin, I feel like a lot of times people describe him as this like certainly he's a powerful individual and has grand ambitions and he is uh a leader of a, of a powerful nation with a, a grand history to it. So that's going to affect people's ability to make decisions that, that affects innumerable populations. So many people are affected by this type of shit, right? So the danger that people see is like, okay, Putin is this like maniacal madman. He's going to launch nukes. It's going to start, a, you know, world war three or whatever. So we need to just like, we need to give him what he wants and then walk away I mean, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this perspective. I mean, I do think everybody wants the, well, not everybody, but many people want the war to end for obvious reasons. And so, you know, what does that look like, at least in maybe Putin's mind and the Ukrainians' minds, like the U.S.? I mean, what would it look like for this conflict to really come to a close in the best possible way? I mean, you know, I, if I, if I could, if I could wave a wand and make it happen, that would be great. You know, I don't know. There's a, there's a set, there's, there's overlapping sets of complicated factors here. I mean, from a basic perspective, um, you have to ask a question about this negotiation, right? So to call for negotiation is not some kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, active, uh, I don't know what what's the word I'm looking for. It's not some kind of supernatural action or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what does a negotiation mean? Oh, we we must negotiate. What negotiate? What? 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 On what terms? Over what? In what context? Right. So you don't just you don't get to just say we have to negotiate. Okay, we have to negotiate now. Okay, does that mean freeze? Freeze hostilities and everybody stays exactly where they are, including the four the four uh, provinces of Ukraine that Russia has officially annexed and currently occupies, where is the motivation on the part of Ukraine to enter into a negotiation on those terms? Ukraine has the offensive. Ukraine has the initiative here. Their counteroffensive was successful over the last two months. They've regained significant territory. They've demonstrated their ability to hammer the Russians in a number of different ways, both through, uh, you know, intelligence uh, uh, actions, guerrilla type actions, like we saw with the bridge, you know, the Crimea bridge, uh, the Kirch, uh, Kirch bridge, or as we've seen with military uh, counteroffensives. So for the Ukrainians, from their perspective, What's there to negotiate? The only reason to negotiate is if the negotiation begins with the Russians returning to the February 24th line, to the mm-hmm. line where they were when this began, mm-hmm. right? Not to the line between 2014, right? But back to the 2024, to, uh, excuse me, to the February 24th, 2022 line when this stage of the war began, right? So if you're Ukraine, that makes that that's only obvious that's the obvious starting point if you're russia that's impossible you're telling me the russians will have will be able to somehow turn around and convince their population that 70 60 maybe 50,000 russian soldiers have died and now we're going to negotiate and we will have gained nothing in all of that time it's impossible from the russian perspective so to me how we begin is 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 itself a million dollar question mm-hmm. right it's obvious that there's going to have to be some kind of territorial concession on both sides whatever mm-hmm. that looks like my guess would be that the russians are going to need to be able and 
this is me being extremely optimistic, which is totally not my personality and not who I am. <laughs> but mm-hmm. but if I'm being extremely optimistic, um, then there's a possibility that the Russians might retreat back to that February 24th line in exchange for formal international recognition of Crimea as Russian. Mm -hmm. Remember that Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. It is not recognized as Russian territory uh, um, by most countries in the world. The Russians have said they're unwilling to discuss anything related to Crimea. So they're certainly unwilling to discuss the idea of Crimea becoming Ukrainian again, or the idea of Crimea being some kind of federated autonomous territory or what have you, right? The Russians are not interested in that. The Mm -hmm. Ukrainians have demanded the return of Crimea. So to me, it would make sense that a logical starting point of a compromise would be over some kind of formal recognition of Crimea as Russian in exchange for a retreat of Russian forces of some kind to some mutually agreed upon line that isn't the full annexation of Zaporizhia, Kherson, Donetsk, and Lugansk. Right now, that would be probably a starting point. I don't know that the Ukrainians would go for that. I don't know. But one would have to think that at some point, Washington has to get on the phone and start leaning on Kiev a little harder and saying, look, it's time to start making a deal and I don't care what you want. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Um, So that's one aspect of it. At the same time, there would also there would also have to be a parallel track negotiation process regarding the sanctions. There's no reason for the Russians to engage in some kind of drawn out peace talks unless they have a guarantee of immediate sanctions relief. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the only way that could happen is if the if that negotiation was also, you know, essentially simultaneously going on. Right, that that in addition to the negotiation over the battlefield and the territory, there's also a negotiation between Russia on the one hand and Europe and the United States on the other to either ease this, I mean, initially to ease the sanctions and hopefully eventually with the end of the war, remove the sanctions entirely, right? Or to some degree, to whatever degree possible. Um, now, that seems, again, extremely optimistic. And I don't, <clears throat> I wouldn't hold my breath for it to go like that. But in answer to the question, what might it look like? That's what it might look like. And and and, and the point being here that it would ultimately be a compromise that would absolutely uh, upset everybody and please nobody. There's no question about that. The Russians are going to be, there's no way the Russians are going to be pleased with what they get out of it. And there's absolutely no way the Ukrainians will be pleased with what they get out of it. And that's probably the way it it should be. I hate to agree with Kissinger, but I do. (laughs) It happens every once in a while. We can't help it. Um, Uh, He he wrote a reasonable piece about uh, uh, the war recently. Really? Fairly reasonable. Much more reasonable than many others. That's interesting. Hmm. Guys live long enough to write a re- write a reasonable piece on something. Well, you know, I mean, but he is. But to be fair, I mean, yeah. Kissinger is somebody who understands the stakes here. I mean, mm-hmm. he's a monster, of course. We yeah. all know who he sure. is. But yeah, yeah. but he he does understand the stakes. I mean, he did live through a tremendous amount of this history and understands what the Russians are capable of and understands what could potentially happen if we make a wrong move. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are that's that's fair, of course. Um, yeah, I, I feel like you're. Yeah, you said you know this is almost an optimistic view that a negotiation could even where the the opening of that even happening seems optimistic. It just feels like this is. I'm sorry, this feels like the thing that you have feared back when we spoke in March is that this would be a prolonged thing and it would just get fucking worse and that this is a quagmire. Yep. And that the character of the the Russian invasion is just that it they can't like you, when you said earlier like it just it just is not you can't even enter the mind of someone like Putin or or the Russians that they would lose and that is fucking dangerous I don't know how else to yep. phrase it it's just it is 
it's one of those things. I, I don't know how, you know, like, how do you say to someone that wants a kind of a, a, a nice little bow on top, you know, like a nice package of like, this is how it'll end. It's like, it's not that it can't be. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not one of these moralistic types, you know, who's like, you can't appease Putin. Mm. You can't like, you can't appease Hitler. Actually, sometimes you can appease people. And sometimes appeasement is the appropriate course of action Mm -hmm. given what your range of options might be so i'm not some you know uh you know whatever uh, um moralist is definitely not the right word but i can't think of the appropriate word for it um but but i will say that um i do think that uh well i believe i believe in um maintaining i believe in maintaining peace to the extent possible. And I believe that when we're, when we're faced with a war, we have to work towards peace. At the mm-hmm. same time, I also believe that people are, should not be subjected to the power of their oppressors. And I do believe in righteous resistance of people who have been invaded, mm-hmm. even when I don't necessarily agree with everything about their government. Right, I agreed mm-hmm. with the righteousness of the resistance of Iraqis against U.S. occupation, just as I did for Afghanistan or for Libya or any other place. Right, those people have every right to resist in every way imaginable. You know, with every fiber of their being, using every tactic available to them, using any weapon that they could, whether it's a rock or uh, you know a bomb strapped to their chest and they walk into a you know a, a building or whatever it is. Right. There, there are forms of resistance and resistance to this kind of oppression is absolutely to be supported. And I do support the right of Ukrainian people to resist this, what is unquestionably an imperial revanchist war, a neo-colonial war, mm-hmm. um, a war of uh, uh, sub-imperial conquest, uh, whatever you want to call it. It's all of those things. And I believe that the Ukrainians have every right to resist and i believe that they should be supported in that to the extent that they can be however i also believe that the war in ukraine is so much bigger than ukraine and that we have a tremendous level of risk for the entire world and i don't just mean because of nuclear weapons there are all kinds of side conflicts that can emerge out of this war the there is i mean i'm just i'm not even going to run through all of them but like just to take a couple i mean there's already been threats of a uh, war between belarus and poland uh, they have a historic animosity towards each other. Uh, they are uh, bitter enemies in many ways. And of course, Belarus is closely aligned with Russia, closely aligned with Putin, very much part of the war in, in Ukraine by providing transit and so forth. And um, generally speaking, Poland and Belarus have already exchanged threats of um mutual destruction let's put it that way Mm -hmm. we also have a number of other conflicts that are being exacerbated by this war both in uh uh you know in that region but also in uh africa in central asia elsewhere so i think that it's not appropriate for us to just ignore all of the implications of this war just because we want to adhere to the principle of support for liberation struggles, Mm -hmm. you know? So this is a complicated moment and it's an awkward moment. It's an awkward place to be for a lot of us. A lot of us feel extremely awkward about, you know, wanting to support a country that is being supported by NATO. At the same time, a lot of us, a lot, and and simultaneously, a lot of others are very awkwardly standing shoulder to shoulder with the far right fascists, you know, as they basically, you know, simp for Putin or whatever it is, you Mm. know, if I'm if I'm using the word simp correctly, I think so. Um, (laughs) And um, and uh, you know, so anyway, my point is that this is this is a. This is a historic, this is a uh, world historic event, the war in Ukraine, that fundamentally changes how a lot of people act and, and view the world. And I think that we have to be mindful of that. And I think that, um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in a sense, 
just giving in to uh, negotiation because that's what Putin wants, it is a form of appeasement. At the same time, we also have to understand that I don't, I don't, as I've mentioned in, in one of my videos recently, I don't think of Putin as some comic book villain. And yeah, I don't yeah. think that he's. I don't think that people do do you know do themselves any service by thinking that way. He's not. He even though he has maybe made historic blunders and uh, he's a vicious monster in a lot of ways. I still believe that he's a rational thinker. He's not a sociopath. He's not an irrational sociopath. And I don't believe that he's somebody who is you know hungering for the end of human civilization. So I do think that his motivations are knowable. And I do think that the more that he talks about nuclear weapons, the weaker. He's indicating that he is, and the more likely he's indicating that he wants to negotiate on his terms. And that's what it's really going to come down to. How much does the United States want to bleed Russia, and how, how far is it willing to push this with all of the risks that are entailed? Now, I have to also mention, as I kind of teased it earlier, but this is important, and I hope your viewers and listeners really think about this and taking this away from this conversation. Everything is dynamic here. Everything is in flux, and much also depends on what's going to happen in 2024. The Russians and the Saudis have been very active in working with Trump and Trump's people for a long time. The Saudis have now poured billions into Trump. I don't know if people have been following this Live Golf Tour, L-I-V, professional golf tour that the Saudi government is funding, that the Saudis have developed. This is a Trump vehicle. This is to funnel billions of dollars to Trump without doing it officially, without doing mm -hmm. it directly. And this is a project, a Kushner project, I would argue, to help to build back Trump's machine. And the Russians, without a doubt, are aware of what this all means for them and for their position. And I think we all know where this is going. And I hope that we're really thinking about this carefully. Trump is going to run to the left of Biden on war in Ukraine. And that is what is being set up here. And that is what the Russians are counting on. That Trump is the one who's going to say, why are you paying four seventy five at the pump for a stupid war in Ukraine? We don't need this war. We don't need a war with Russia. We need to make America great again. Hmm. That's coming. And everyone, you can mark my words, that's what we can discuss when I come back in 18 months. And that's what he's saying. You will see. Yeah, you will come back and, and we'll revisit that. <laughs> I think you're right. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Why not? And Putin's counting on it. That's the thing. He's waiting for it. And the thing is that if you think that the Russian government and the Russian state is going to collapse in the next 12 months, it might. It's possible. It's absolutely possible. It happened. It happened 35 years ago, 33 years ago. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's absolutely possible. But I wouldn't hold my breath. And I would say that uh, there is a very good likelihood that um, governments change in Washington and in London and in Berlin before they do in Moscow.